Hello everyone and welcome to this new lecture of the series on fluid electrolyte and acid base disorders. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the channel and like the videos. This series is based on my book, Manual of Fluid, Electrolyte, and Acid-Based Disorders, A Pathophysiologic Approach to Common Clinical Problems. I'm Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I'm a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. This is the book. You can find it on Amazon. Please follow the link below. It's available as an ebook and hardcover. Both are in full color, and also there is a paperback edition. We are still on chapter 7, and this is lecture 53. Today we are going to do case studies in hypophosphatemia and also hyperphosphatemia. Case number 1. 55-year-old man on chronic hemodialysis presents with a serum phosphorus of 7 mg per deciliter on his first monthly laboratory panel. The patient also has iron deficiency anemia. The patient is on epigen. What is the best approach to his high phosphorus? Now, first, uh, he should be counseled by the dietitian and the nephrologist to restrict phosphate in his diet to 1 gram per 24 hours. If we increase his dialysis time, that will certainly reduce his phosphate, but most patients are reluctant to do so. Now, uh, usually we use phosphate binders and we have wide choices. In this patient, using ferric citrate, also known as orexia, may be helpful. Usually we start with two tablets three times a day with meals because ferric citrate will provide not only iron but also will bind phosphorus. So you get both. Um, other than that, you can use uh, intravenous or oral iron and use a, a different binder, but it makes, as, it makes sense in this patient. Case number two, the same patient one month later has a serum phosphorus of 9.8. So we prescribed a binder and his phosphorus has worsened from 7 to 9.8. His iron deficiency anemia did not improve either. Do we increase the dose of orexia or ferric citrate? Do we add another binder? Do we uh, substitute uh, something, a different binder, uh, for the ferric citrate? What do we do? Now, the patient's phosphate has worsened because he's not taking his binder. So non-adherence to binders is very, very common. This is one of the most frustrating problems in dialysis. So we need to provide education. Some patients don't like the taste of a certain binder. Some binders are chewable, like uh, lanthanum, for example, uh, like uh, velforo, and some people don't like that. Um, other people do. Some patients go to the pharmacy and find out that the binder costs $400, and they just don't buy it, and they don't tell you. So we have to provide financial assistance. We have uh, to maybe prescribe a different binder in that case. So just increasing the dose is not helpful. Adding another binder if the patient is not taking the first one is also not helpful. So uh, we have to address these issues first. Case number three. A new renal dietitian at your dialysis unit is asking about the relative potency of phosphate binders. Are they all the same? Are there any differences in binding? What do we tell her? Now, the approximate amount of bound phosphate is the same for the following. So these are the equivalencies. Six 1,000 milligram tablets of calcium carbonate, like Tums, will bind the same as nine tablets of calcium acetate, and here the milligrams are fixed. It's always 667 milligrams, which is the same as six 500 milligram tablets of lanthanum carbonate. Now, lanthanum is available as 250, 500, and 750 milligrams. Uh, the same as 10 tablets of sevalimer carbonate. Each one is 800 milligrams. The same as nine tablets of ferric sulfate. Each one is one gram, and one gram of ferric citrate um, contains 210 milligrams of ferric iron. And finally, this is equivalent to 3.75 uh, 
tablets of sucroferric oxyhydroxide or Velforo, each one is 500 milligrams. So the most potent of all the binders are the sucroferic oxyhydroxide and the lanthanum carbonate. So if the number of pills is an issue, this is what you should go for, assuming price is not an object, but both are chewables. Okay, both you have to uh, uh, chew the lanthanum carbonate and the oxyhydroxide, uh, uh, su uh, sucroferic oxyhydroxide, both are chewable. Generally speaking, we prefer non-calcium-based binders because we don't want to give a big calcium load. Calcium load should not be more than 1,500 milligrams per day. So one tablet of calcium acetate has 25% of elemental calcium by weight. So each tablet or capsule is 667 milligrams. This is fixed. So it has 166 milligrams of calcium. So if we give nine tablets of calcium acetate, we give a daily calcium load of 1.5 grams. So this is three calcium acetate tablets three times a day. You should never go higher than that. Usually I don't go more than two, but three is probably fine. Now, if we want to use calcium carbonate and achieve the same binding, we will have to use 6,000 milligrams. Now, 6,000 milligrams of calcium carbonate contain 2.4 grams of calcium because it has more calcium, 40% by weight. This is undesirable and unacceptable, especially the younger the patient, then uh, the more careful you have to be with uh, giving them calcium. Case number four, a 60-year-old woman is on mechanical ventilation due to bilateral bacterial pneumonia. Weaning has been difficult. They checked a phosphorus and it was only one milligram per deciliter. How would you manage this hypophosphatemia? As we said when we talked about hypophosphatemia, if you have severe hypophosphatemia, weaning off mechanical ventilation is going to be difficult. Here the hypophosphatemia is severe. We need to replace either with phosphate, uh, sodium phosphate, or potassium phosphate. We start with 30 millimoles over four hours, and then we recheck the level and repeat as needed. Now, if the patient is on total parenteral nutrition, TPN, we should add phosphate and adjust it accordingly. And if the patient is on enteral nutrition solution, we should not use a low phosphate solution like NEPRO, N-E-P-R-O, which is intended for uh, patients with uh, chronic kidney disease and acute kidney injury because their phosphate is usually high. Case number five, 33-year-old man with chronic diarrhea presents with low phosphorus of 2, low calcium of 7.8, and low potassium of 3.4 due to his diarrhea. How would you uh, replace his electrolytes? Now, when we have low phosphorus and uh, low calcium, we should check vitamin D. I mean, this patient has diarrhea. It's very conceivable that he has uh, vitamin D deficiency, which is fat soluble. So you check 25-hydroxy-D, and usually it's going to be very low, and you have to replace that. So you're halfway there. Now, um, you want to use KFOS neutral tablets. Uh, this is appropriate because he has low potassium and low phosphorus, so you are replacing both. You give one to two tablets three to four times a day. The main GI side effect is, unfortunately, diarrhea, and this patient has diarrhea already, so you have to be careful. This limits how much we can use. We need also to supplement calcium, and we hopefully should find out why he has chronic diarrhea and try to fix the cause. Case number six, here we have a 65-year-old woman with a known history of advanced cholangiocarcinoma. I saw her in the office, and her creatinine was 1.1 milligram per deciliter, but she had hyperphosphatemia, 7.1. This is one month after she started treatment with pimigatinib. How would you manage this hyperphosphatemia? Hyperphosphatemia is due to the pimigatinib, which is a kinase inhibitor and an FGFR inhibitor. Most patients actually develop hyperphosphatemia, like 70%. The patient was instructed on a low phosphate diet, and actually I saw her on some samples of sucroferic oxyhydroxide or a Velforo, 500 milligrams three times daily with meals to bind phosphorus. Then she got a prescription. The treatment was very successful. One month later, her phosphorus was down to 3.2 and the creatinine remained unchanged. The treatment with pemigatinib, which is indicated for her uh, cancer, was never interrupted. 
Case number seven, 55 year old woman presents with generalized bone pain, diffuse muscle weakness. Her phosphorus was very low, one milligram per deciliter, calcium 8.1. Alkaline phosphatase was elevated at 201 unit per liter. She had a high fraction excretion of phosphate in the urine, 51%, very high. So she has hypophosphatemia and hyperphosphaturia. What's the next diagnosis? So we know here it has something to do with the, with the bones. Now here, after extensive evaluation and thinking and looking at multiple textbooks, uh, tumor-induced osteomalacia, TIO was suspected. She had a CT scan. It showed a mass consistent with a mesenchymal tumor. Uh, FGF23 titer was sent to a reference laboratory and came back very elevated at 402 RU per ml. This is a very high level. The tumor was resected. The diagnosis was phosphaturic mesenchymal tumor mixed connective tissue. The patient has surgery. The tumor was resected. And slowly, uh, her uh, urine, phosphorus, serum phosphorus, alkaline phosphatase, calcium, FGF23 level all returned to the normal range. Here's the last case. Five-year-old boy presented with rickets, multiple skeletal deformities, osteomalacia, laboratory evaluation revealed hypophosphatemia, hyperphosphaturia, low 125D, and elevated FGF23. What is the likely diagnosis? Again, this is the kind of thing where you really need uh, your textbook to see what's going on. I mean, you know that he has rickets. You know the skeletal deformities, you know the osteomalacia, uh, you know there's a problem with, with phosphate, but you usually you check 25 hydroxy D, 125 dihydroxy D, FGF23, phosphorus, calcium, etc., and try to put it all together. The answer is X linked, X linked hypophosphatemic rickets, XLH. It was suspected, confirmed by genetic testing. Like we said, uh, this is an autosomal dominant disorder responsible for more than 80% of the cases of familial hypophosphatemia. So on a test, guess XLH, and you probably would be right. This form is due to loss of function mutation in the PHEX gene, and uh, FGF23 rises. When it rises, you are going to have low serum phosphorus, high urine phosphorus, and low 125 dihydroxy D level or low calcitriol level. So you have renal phosphate wasting. The patient was started on the specific indicated treatment for that disorder, which is borosumab. This is a recombinant human monoclonal antibody, and it blocks FGF23. Let's leave this chapter with key points. There are three main phosphate regulating hormones, PTH, vitamin D, and FGF23 slash clotho. Phosphate level is maintained by the interplay between these three hormonal systems and also the bowels. What do they do? They absorb phosphorus to the kidneys, they reabsorb phosphorus and excrete some of it, and then you have the shift of phosphate between the intracellular fluid and the extracellular fluid and also the bone. The bone, they uptake phosphate and they also release it. Hypophosphatemia is the result of poor dietary intake or decreased intestinal absorption. Sometimes you have renal phosphate we wasting or even intracellular shift of phosphate. Most commonly is due to malnutrition and vitamin D deficiency. Finally, hyperphosphatemia is mainly seen in patients with acute kidney injury, advanced chronic kidney disease, stages 4 or 5, or those already on hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. It is treated by binders and also with dietary phosphate restriction. This concludes chapter 7. Thank you.